Well, good day, everybody. My name is Jason Beck, and I'm manager of community and corporate relations for Waypoints up here in Fort McMurray. And of course, we're here today for the Alberta CAC roundtable discussion, which our topic is on sex torsion today. And I'm really happy to have as my guest today, Lindsay Lobb, who's with the Canadian Center for Child Protection. So, hey, Lindsay, good to have you. Hi, welcome. So glad to have you here, or be here. <laughs> awesome. So, of course, before we jump into our topic today of sex torsion, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and about the role that you do within the Canadian Center for Child Protection. For sure. So, um, I've been with the Canadian Center since 2008. Um, my background is actually as a social worker, and uh, primarily um, my role here is working with families that have missing and sexually exploited children, um, helping to coordinate our supports to survivors and working with stakeholder groups like police and like yourself and uh, child welfare and victim services. Awesome, great. Well, we're certainly glad to have you as a, as a expert on this topic, we're gonna call you. I don't know if you call yourself that or not, but oh, we're gonna call you that. So I, I would settle in because we're gonna, we're gonna call you that. No, but we're okay. certainly glad to have you and have your perspective here with us for this topic. So of course, like any topic, you have to define it first uh, for people's benefit. So what is sextortion? Yeah, so the long and the short of it is that sextortion is blackmail. So uh, what we primarily involves in this, in this context though is when someone threatens to send a sexual image or a video uh, to of you to other people if you don't pay them or if you don't uh, provide more nude images. Um, if the if your viewers are looking for more information specifically on that topic, we do have a great website called don'tgetsextorted.ca that really uh, gets more into the the definition of the issue. So. Um... Of course, we oftentimes want to talk about youth and protecting young people. So help us understand who sex towards youth. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a really inter interesting question because there isn't really um, a profile of who extorts youth um, in terms of this, this issue. But what we do see through the tip line that we operate, which is cybertip.ca, we do see some general themes um, on what's happening to youth online. So one of the groups that we see is groups or individuals that are looking to have a monetary gain um, by sextorting a youth. So typically these are offenders that are living overseas um, that will target multiple people sort of indiscriminately. So they might target youth, they might target adults. They're really just, their goal is to get money. Um, and this population is actually really over overrepresented within the male victimization. Um, that's what, we, what we're generally seeing in that space. Um, on the, then we also see um, those that actually do have a sexual interest in children. So we have offenders that are targeting children for the purposes of sextorting them to get more imagery um, because they have a sexual interest in, in, the, in the child. Um, but then what we're also starting to see is we're also starting to see this uh, issue in the context of dating relationships um, as really another tactic that is used um, in context of an intimate partner um, violent relationship. So what we're seeing is images that have been shared between consenting um, youth um, in the context of a romantic relationship. And then those images might be subsequently used to either threaten or coerce the youth to stay with them um, or in the context of revenge. Um, and then what we're seeing as an additional layer in that in that area is where if the images are in are shared sort of beyond their intended recipient, um, they might end up being sextorted not by their partner or their ex partner, but by actually a third party who that partner has shared the image with. So there's lots of different ways that this happens. Um, and, and we continue to see this as an evolving issue. Interesting. So did I hear you correctly say you were saying this is a more male prevalent uh, victimization? So there's, it's mostly well, male victims? Uh, you know, it, in, the, in the context of the overseas um, offenders that are looking to gain monetary, like to, for a monetary gain, then yes, then males are overrepresented in that area um, mm -hmm. as compared to the other areas, which would be more typically what we would see in terms of female victimization. So the female organization will be more through relationships, I guess, would be the assumption that I would make. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And I guess a, a question that I would have to ask then is what is the prevalence of this in our country? Um, and I, I don't know if you have statistics with regards to specifically in Alberta or not, uh, but within mm -hmm. our country, like what is the prevalence of sextortion uh, in our country right now? 
You know, I don't, um, I don't actually have the stats off the top of my head. Um, but you know, it is, it is an issue so much so that we actually created an entire campaign, um, addressing this issue. So, um, if you've ever seen the naked mole rat campaign, um, which is posted on our don't Se get sex .ca website, um, you know, we, re we did see a, a major increase in the issue, um, over the last number of years, which is why we wanted to get the information out there to parents and to youth about what to do if they find themselves in this situation. And so what, um, where, where is this happening basically? So what are, are I'm, I'm assuming this is through apps or through other means like that. So where, where are we seeing this happen? So typically we are seeing it occur um, starting on an online platform. So there are many, many of the social media platforms whether it be, you know, something like Instagram or Snapchat um, or something um, that is a little bit more anonymous like um, Google, we are seeing the, a lot of the sex abortion incidents start there and then offenders are moving youth into a more private chat um, area like Discord, for example, or uh, Kick Messenger where they can then get images more directly. Um, however, like I was saying before, with the different types of sextortion is that we are also seeing this occur um, in real life relationships where you actually do actually get the person in real life. Um, and then there becomes a sextortion component as a part of um, the, the intimate partner violence that we're seeing. So we, de you know, there's more likelihood that it's going to start online, um, but we are really seeing a, a huge increase in the intimate partner side of things. So what are some of the warning signs that people can look out for, specifically, I guess, parents or caregivers for our young, young people and children? What are some yeah. of the warning signs that they can watch out for? Yeah, you know, I think the warning signs can really vary. Um, but ultimately, what we're looking for is a youth that appears to be in distress. Um, and, you know, that, that sort of is the signal to parents or to teachers to start to dig a little bit deeper and start asking some questions about what the root of the distress is. Because... We know that that can be many, many things depending on what's going on in a young person's life. So you can see things um, like, you know, youth becoming overly withdrawn, um, where they are sleeping, oversleeping or undersleeping, overeating or undereating. Um, they can be appear very fearful or very worried um, and sort of a general emotional dysregulation um, that we're seeing in who we know at this age are very susceptible to mental health um, issues such as depression and anxiety. So when we start to see those signals of a youth being in distress, that's when we start to ask some questions and dig a little deeper. Interesting. So can you kind of take us through, you kind of have a little bit, but maybe give us um, some specific examples of the process um, that leads to sextortion. So some of the examples of, uh, of you know, I guess, what what is that rabbit trail that people get taken down? You've alluded to it a bit, but maybe we can dive a little bit deeper into that. Sure. Um, yeah. So like I was saying, you know, what we're typically seeing is um, youth being targeted on social media apps. And many times they are adding people as friends, like even if they have um, privacy, uh, put privacy stipulations put on their accounts, they're receiving friend requests from people that they might think that they know, um, because that person has um, friended other friends of theirs. And so they might think, oh, well, there's a connection here. So I think I know this person. So it's okay to add them. Um, and we also see, though, places like Omegle um, that are, you know, right when you get onto the site, it's everything is just very open. Um, and very, um, they're purporting talking to strangers on that site. So it's really concerning that, you know, while there are youth that are being targeted who do have their privacy settings on their account and are still becoming victimized, um, whereas there's all other youth that are on more open sites where we're seeing them being victimized, um, you know, more quickly that way too. Um, then we are, like I was saying too, is we're also seeing the sort of rise in the being targeted um, or being victimized through people that they know. Um, so whether that be a partner or an ex-partner um, or somebody that has received their photo through, a, through somebody that the child knows through a mutual friend. So that's, that's one of the processes that we're, that we're seeing there. So let's dive into the idea then of how does, how does one, um, well, how do parents, for example, or caregivers uh, protect their children or what kind of things do we tell them 
in order to recognize the signs. So what's the conversation that parents and caregivers need to be having with their, their children and young people to say like, these are the things you watch out for. What, mm -hmm. what does that look like? Well, and you know, I think this is a really interesting conversation because you know, it, the conversations about online safety and sex extortion, they need to happen, start happening way before this is ever a youth potentially being targeted. Um, not only because it's a learned behavior, right? We have parents who, um, who are able, when they're able to talk to their children at a younger age and start having those safety conversations about healthy personal boundaries and healthy relationships that start when the children are four, five, and six years old. Um, you know, it just embeds that idea of healthy boundaries and the, the child has an idea of how to carry those over into potentially online situations. Um, the other piece that's really important is for parents to reinforce that they're there to help their child if something does go sideways or go wrong, um, that they the child can come to them, that they're not going to be mad. Um, I think it's really important to start having those conversations early and and really reinforce the healthy relationship boundaries and that those don't just apply to um, your in-person encounters, but they actually also apply to anything online. Um, and you know, what we're also seeing as a really concerning trend is that younger and younger children are being targeted for this. Um, you know, we've seen children as young as six years old who have been targeted um, by, by adults online. And so, you know, it is important that with children, um, especially right now, because they're so spending so much more time online, to have these conversations early and have them consistently and, uh, with their children as they grow. Um, so that's the conversation side. On the other side, you know, it's really important to discuss with your older children, what are the risks um, with, that are associated with technology. Um, you can use media as an example. So if the media story comes up, but use that as an opportunity to sort of open up a conversation with your child and remind them about the risks of, uh, of technology and to never comply with a threat. I think that's one of the, the things that we see consistently is uh, when youth are coming into our tip line, it's often because they have complied and now they don't know what to do. Um, so they were you know, reinforcing that not to ever comply with a threat online is really important. And so by comply, you mean to actually carry out whatever it is they're asking for, so money or whatever, yes. not just the sending of the picture, but but comply with actually doing what they're asking for. Exactly, exactly. Just okay. not to comply, talk to a safe adult. Um, and if, this, if you don't have a safe adult that they feel comfortable going to, they can contact us. Um, you know, we have cybertip.ca where um, you can come in and we also have a website called needhelpnow.ca that really walks you through what steps can you take and also how do you start that conversation with a safe adult and get some and I assume, would there be videos as well, perhaps? Because I know that sometimes parents, some parents can have a very difficult time talking about these things. Like I grew up in a generation where you don't talk about anything like this, not even remotely close. So is there a place where, uh, you know, uh, videos, for example, that a parent could show their mm -hmm. child and then kind of have the conversation afterwards? Does that yeah, you know, out there? Yeah, you know, you read my mind because that's, <laughs> that's actually something brand new that we have right now. Um, that's up on our website on protectchildren.ca um, and it's right on the front page under a spot that's called timely supports and the reason why we created these videos is because of the increase in risk that we're seeing during covid while we are all spending so much more time online mm -hmm. so there's actually a series of videos that uh for 12 to 14 year olds and there's another series of videos for 15 to 17 year olds and parents, they're very short, they're four to five minutes long. They address different topics related to personal and online victimization. And they're a great way for parents to introduce that topic and to, to have a conversation about what they're both watching in video. Interesting. Now, sorry, I have to ask you because you just said they're very short, but 45 minutes long. Was oh, that sorry, four, four yes. to five. Oh, four to five minutes. Okay, perfect. Just wanted to make sure because I'm like, wow, she calls that a short video. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's me. That's me talking fast. That's fine. <laughs> All good. Well, it's on Zoom as well, so sometimes it's hard to hear clearly yeah. hear when you're on Zoom, for sure. For sure. Okay. Well, interesting. That's great to hear that that resources, those resources are out there. Congratulations yeah. for doing that, because I think that's so important. Because yeah. a lot of times we just don't know how to talk about this, these issues. Absolutely. And you know, one other thing too that's really important to remember is that you know, as much as we're talking to parents about 
what is out there for them to intervene or to teach their children, um, we need to remember that this responsibility doesn't solely fall on parents. Um, they, you know, there is a responsibility of industry and of these, uh, these organizations that create these platforms to ensure that they're safe for their users, um, whether that's their intended users or that they're for, for the children that they're actually built for. So I think, you know, parents should know, too, that we at the Canadian Centre are taking steps to advocate um, to industry to take steps to make um, this the Internet a safer space for kids. Good. Love that. Love that. So then um, obviously once um, once a parent has discovered or a child has disclosed to their parent um, that something has happened, either that they somebody has asked me for an image or they've actually complied. Um, how does somebody report sex torsion? What's what's the where do they go? Yeah, so they can report to us at cybertip.ca um, or you can report to your local police service, um, whatever parents feel or you feel most comfortable with. Um, but that's that's a really easy and simple way to report. Awesome, awesome. So what happens then once a report has been made? So what can people expect? So yeah, so when a family contacts us, um, what we'll do generally is ensure that we're meeting their needs. Um, so we're going to have a conversation to ensure that um, they understand the steps going forward. And we're really going to base our response on the unique situation. So sometimes that does mean involving police. Um, and sometimes that doesn't. It's, it's, we also try try as much as possible to take the family's um, uh, wishes into account to ensure that if you know, they don't want to report to police or they don't want to trigger a criminal process, in, in some circumstances, there doesn't need to be, and we can assist um, in the removal of damage. So, um, you know, it's it's a really kind of a complicated answer because no two situations are going to be the same. So, Lindsay, of course, as you mentioned earlier, we, we are in a pandemic, and so people are home, depending on where you are in the country right now. Some kids are home. Some kids are back in school. There's a mixture of both around the country right now. But, but certainly even for the months that they have been home, what effects has the pandemic had um, on our youth and children right now, and especially when it comes to topics like sex extortion? Yeah, you know, really, I mean, I don't know if it's a surprise for people, but um, for us, it's a bit unsurprising that our statistics have really, really increased over um, the, pan the, the range of the pandemic. So between April and June of this year, we received an 81% increase of reports coming in through the tip line related to either youth receiving sexual images or uh, videos from adults online, uh, being coerced into sending images or having sexual images of themselves shared online. Um, and, you know, I think this is simply a matter of youth being online online more and offenders knowing that right um you know that we do we do know that there's communications um between offenders on you know saying we know kids are, are online more when they're taking steps to them so this is again a really timely conversation to help um the canadian public un better understand what the risks are and where to go to get support um, so I, I love this conversation. I think this has been certainly very informative, but I would like to ask you this last question. Like, what is one piece of advice that you would share with uh, with the community right now? Yeah, you know, I think one of the biggest things is is that to educate yourself. Um, you know, we have some great resources on our website, like, like I uh, referenced already. Um, and then if you see any concerning of behavior online to report it. Um, you know, I think a lot, a lot of times people are hesitant to report or they don't know where to report. And so, you know, going to cybertip.ca and learning a little bit more and, you know, making report is really steps that we're taking towards better protecting children. Fantastic. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much. Uh, definitely welcome. informative. Um, I'll mention everybody that we will be posting all the websites that you've mentioned. We'll post that at the end of this video so you can have those, uh, those links. It'll also be in the chat of uh, any of the postings uh, that we do put out uh, with this video. So certainly want to thank you again. And uh, this has been a very interesting and sobering topic for sure. One that I didn't know um, certainly a lot about and I did not know the, uh, the extent of it for sure. Yeah. So I really appreciate your time today. You're so welcome. I really appreciate the opportunity to share this information. All right. Take care. Thanks, Jason.